machen, I cannot fall, listening every moment to the spirit call, resting in my Savior as my all in all, standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, Standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God. Be seated, please. Good morning. I'd also like to welcome our guests. Thank you for coming and, and worshiping God here at North Highlands with us this morning. And uh, again, we'd love for you to fill out the, the uh, card on the back of the pew in front of you so we'll have a record of your attendance. And uh, stick around for a little while afterwards that we might greet you and thank you personally uh, for being with us today. Um, what a great week we've had and uh, enjoyed being with our family and friends and, and uh, remembering the things that we're thankful for. Hopefully, uh, as we've gone around our tables at home and talked about the things that we're thankful for and been reminded uh, of things maybe that others in our family are thankful for uh, now this week and in the coming days, we can capitalize on those things and, and uh, bring out even more things for our, our families to be thankful for and to help them to see that thanksgiving in our, our hearts, uh, not just one day a year, but every every single day uh, of, of the year, that they might always see us as thankful and grateful people for all that God has given to us. And this morning, I'd like for us to talk about some of the promises that God has given to us. Great and precious promises, as we were reading there in Second Peter 1 and verse 4 specifically. It says, by which we have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these, listen to that, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. He says, that through these, through the promises, you can be a partaker of the divine nature. You can become more like him. It's based on the promises that he's given. Why did he give us these promises? Why did he say these things? So that you and I could be partakers with him of these precious things, of these things that we might know God and that we might understand the purpose that he has in our lives. The promises of God, they are exceedingly great and precious. And I just consider what these promises do in our lives, the amazing strength that we see in other Christians as they struggle, as they go through hard times, or as they face illnesses. We see this in them, and we see the promises of God that bring strength to their heart and that help them as they walk through those situations. Without his promises, we'd surely lose motivation to serve God or, or to serve other people. But because of those promises, we recognize the value other people have to him. And therefore to us also. And those promises empower us to reach deep in ourselves. To care for those in need. To uh, emulate his amazing ability to care for us. To put that into practice in our lives. Because of his promises we give of ourselves. We make sacrifices of our time and of our material goods. And we endure hardships because we know his ways are above our ways. We know that he's so much greater than us. And so we hold on every day looking forward to the completion of the promises God has made. You know, there's a big difference between His promises and our promises. There's a big difference between uh, when God makes a promise and when a mere person, a mere man, a mere woman makes a promise. Uh, the fact is, as a general rule, promises of men mean very little. They don't hold up over time. And it's not uh, because they're terrible people or because we, we uh, are awful and make terrible promises. Uh, the, the reason, the fact is, we're, we're limited. We're limited in our power to see things through. In Matthew 5 and verse 36, Jesus reminds you, nor shall you swear by your head because you cannot make one hair white or black. He says, you can't do it. You have no authority. You have no power to change these types of things. They're above you. So we can't promise anything of great uh, magnitude because we lack the ability to fulfill it. We just don't have that ability. And the other thing is we have no control over the future. In James chapter 4 and verse 13, remember 
what he says. He says, come now, you who say today or tomorrow we'll go and do such a city and we'll spend a year there and we'll buy and sell and we'll make profit, whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? Is it even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away? We have no control over the future. We have no ability to force what we desire to happen into the future because the fact is, our life is just a vapor. We're just here for a short time. This life is just a preparation for the next life. This is life in seed form, and we're looking forward to life in Christ, in the the spirit, uh, where true life begins after this life ends. You see, if we make a promise, it's got to be qualified And James 4 and verse 15 follows, he says, Instead, what you ought to say is, If the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or we'll do that. Everything we say must be qualified. It's all based on what God wills, not what I will. I don't have the power, I don't have the authority uh, for my promises to hold the weight that God's promises actually hold. The fact is, the truth is that we are unfaithful. We're not as faithful as, and, and because of our unfaithfulness and because of our track record in our life, we recognize we don't keep our promises like we should. Think about Romans chapter 7 and verse 18 where Paul is inspired by the Holy Spirit to go into some personal talk and to explain personally how he struggles. And it's the same struggle that you and I feel every day. It's the struggle of every human being. He says there in Romans 7 and verse 18, I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells, for to will is the present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. He says, I know what I should do, but I don't do it. And then verse 19, he says, for the good that I want to do, I do not do, but it's the evil that I don't want to do that I'm actually practicing. Now, if I do what I will not to do, it's no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells in me. And I find a law that is present within me, The one who wants to do good but doesn't. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin. O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? He says, I want to do right, but I don't. I'm unfaithful. I'm not true. I don't continue through with my promises. And I don't know why. Because I want to, but I fall short. He says, oh, wretched man, who is it? And then verse 25, he answers it, and he says, thank God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, it's Jesus. It's only Jesus who can save us from our unfaithfulness. It's only Jesus who can lift us up to a higher level and that can make us who we ought to be rather than who we actually are. In Matthew 26 and 41, Jesus reminds us by talking to his disciples, and he says, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And we know it's true, don't we? So we have struggles with our promises. But God, he has no struggle. He is faithful. God is perfect in keeping his promises. He has unlimited power in order to bring about the things that he has said. In Isaiah 40 and verse 12, it tells us, Who is it that has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? Who has measured heaven with a span and collected the dust of the earth in a measure? Who has weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance? He says it's God. It's God Almighty who holds all of this in his hands. He has unlimited power. In Ephesians 3 and verse 20 it says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us. He said it's Jesus. God's power It's so much greater than ours. It is unlimited, and he can overcome, and he can accomplish anything that he promises. The other thing is he has total control over the future. In Romans 4 and verse 17, it reminds us there that uh, God is the one who gives life to the dead and calls on those things which do not exist as if they did. He says, listen, I know what's going to happen in the future, and I can name things that will occur in the future. And he does it throughout the Old Testament. In the prophecies, he calls names. He calls uh, specific actions that people will take. He knows the future, and he proves it to us time and time again. He holds the future in his hands. He told Abram in Genesis 17 and verse 5, Your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations before 
Abraham was a father of anything because he knew and he holds the future in his hands. God's promises mean everything because God is faithful. In Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse 9, I'd encourage you to highlight this verse in your Bible. Maybe go back through it, uh, to it this week and, and, and study it with your family and your family devotionals. And remember, Deuteronomy 7 and verse 9, Therefore know that the Lord your God, He is God, the faithful God, who keeps covenant and mercy for a thousand generations with those who love Him and keep His commandments. Who does He keep it with? Those who love Him and keep His commandments. God is faithful. In 1 Kings 8 and verse 56, it says, Blessed be the Lord, who has given rest to His people Israel according to all that He promised. There has not failed one word of all His good promise, which He promised through His servant Moses. God fulfills His promises. He's faithful. And he'll continue to be faithful. And so you can have confidence. You can stand on the promises of God, knowing that they will be fulfilled because he has continually always kept his promises. He has seen them through, and he's made good on everything that he's ever said. Now, Christian, what about the promises he's made to you? What about the promises that you hold dear, that you have in your possession right now? They give you strength every single day. I'd like for us just to look at a few of them to be reminded of these promises. First and maybe foremost is the fact that he has given us the total forgiveness of sins. He has forgiven our sins. In Hebrews 8 and verse 12 it says, I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds. I will remember no more. Why? Why would you do this, God? Why would you make a promise to forget the things that we've done wrong, to wash them away and, and to allow us to live in freedom and to have joy in our hearts? How can we have so much confidence in these promises? He says, hold fast to the confession of your hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. Hebrews 10, 23. He says, I want you to hold fast. And this is why I will fulfill my promise of forgiving your sins. That through these promises, you will become more like him. That you will truly embody the name Christian, not just wear it, not just think of it, not just have it as something as part of your life, but it would be your life. That you would grow into the name that you've been given by God. Christian, one who is like Christ because of his promises and because of your obedient faith in his promises. You see, he forgives and he forgets. In 1 John 1 and verse 5, he says, This is the message which we have heard from him and we declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him but we walk in darkness, we're liars. We don't practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. He says the Bible, uh, the Bible teaches us here that Jesus continually cleanses the Christian. He continually washes us as we're striving to walk in the light. Now, there's not some kind of uh, perfection that we can never achieve that God expects here. What he's teaching us here is the fact that as we set our heart on him and as we strive in every aspect of our life to be like him and to follow him and to allow his promises to to build in our hearts a, a place for him to rule a throne for him to sit on and as we walk that path of righteousness that he knows that we're frail he knows that we're going to be unfaithful he knows that we're going to fall and he says and yet i will continually cleanse you as you strive for righteousness as you continue to walk in my way, rather than taking the selfish route, rather than continually turning your back on me. He says in chapter 2 there in 1 John, verse 1, My little children, these things I write to you that you may not sin. He says, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't be unfaithful. Don't fall back on your promises. Don't fall back on your commitment. Always see them through. Be more like me. Don't sin. And in the next breath he says, And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. 
And he is the one who's the propitiation for our sins. And so he is the one who cleanses us continually. He is the one who will continue to wash you of those sins in your life if you will continually follow after him rather than choosing your own path, rather than going after the selfish things of this life, rather than choosing to do things your way, that you would stay with him in his way. God is faithful, and he has given us a promise that he will forgive our sins. So there's no need to be smothered with guilt over past sins. You should live like you're loved. You should live like you're set free. Because you have a promise from God that you can stand on, a promise that you can have confidence in. He will forgive you. Another promise that we have from God is peace that passes understanding in Philippians 4 and verse 6. He says, Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God. In what? Verse 7. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Jesus. How does it pass understanding? How is it that we can't actually comprehend the peace that God can bring into our lives? We can have peace, and we can have it so abundantly that we don't even understand it, that we can't comprehend it, that it passes our ability to understand. And we see this in other people, don't we? We see this peace in them, and we think, how? How do they have a smile on their face? How how are they in this building after this, the surgery that they've had, how, how are they holding their heads up after the loss that they've just experienced? The peace that passes understanding. We don't understand it, but God will bring peace into our life, and it's a promise that he's given to us. <clears throat> a young man applied for a job as a farmhand, and when the farmer asked for his qualifications, the young man just uh, kind of crossed his arm and he said, well, I can sleep when the wind blows. And the farmer thought, well, that's kind of weird, you know, but he needed, a hire, he needed a hand, and this was the only guy who was there, and so he's like, all right, you're hired. And a few days later, the farmer and his wife were awakened in the night by a violent storm. And they quickly jumped up, and they started to check things and, and make sure everything was secure, and they found that the shutters on the farmhouse had been securely fastened. And there was a good supply of logs set next to the fireplace. And the young man was in there, and he was sleeping soundly. The farmer and his wife inspected their property. They they looked, and they found that the farm tools were all placed in the shed, just where they were supposed to be. They found out that the tractor had been moved into the garage, and that the barn was properly locked, and even the animals were calm because they had plenty of food, and they were taken care of. All was well. It was then that the farmer, it dawned on him, he understood the meaning of what the man said, I can sleep when the wind blows. Why? Because the farmhand had done his work loyally and faithfully when the skies were cleared and it prepared him for the storm. If you wonder why you don't have more peace in your life, it's not because God's presence is not there. It's because you have failed to prepare. Is because you haven't spent the time when skies are clear, when things are good, preparing for when times are not as good. I want you to be a person. I want to be a person who can sleep when the wind blows, who, who has a peace that passes understanding, who, who has their, their hope built on the promises of God. And because of that, we can have confidence in times of trouble. So do you have peace because of your preparation? Have you obedient faith in your heart so that when times of struggle come upon you, you will stand firm in the promises of God? I encourage you to be one who can sleep when the wind blows. Have a peace that passes understanding. You know, we have another promise from God in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13, one that we take much comfort from. He tells us that we won't be overcome by the trials that we face in this life. He says, no temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. And God is faithful. And he says, He will not allow you to be tempted above what you are able, but with the temptation will also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. You know, oftentimes the way of escape is apparent before we get into the temptation, isn't it? Most of the time, it takes preparation to say, Okay, now in this situation, I'm going to already have a plan. 
If I go into this uh, type of situation, if this occurs in my life, I already know how I'm going to behave because I've already talked it over with the Lord and I've come up with a plan of how I should behave based on what Jesus would do, right? And so I have a promise from him that I will be able to overcome those things, that I will uh, not be torn down by my trials, but it's based on my deciding to follow him first in my life. It's not that I'm going to get shocked with some news or, or something, uh, calamity is going to happen in my life and then I'm going to be bewildered and, uh, and unsure of what happens next. Well, we might go through times like that where we're confused, where we're uncertain, uh, where things happen. But the thing that we know is that God is faithful. Even through those times, even through times that shock us and confuse us, God is faithful and He will help us through that hardship or that difficulty that comes upon us. God assures us that we can bear it. And that's why we fight, isn't it? Isn't that why we, we struggle? Isn't that why we stay in and strive to make a difference? We try harder because we have the promise that we can overcome. And that we can do these things in the name of Jesus Christ when we're faced with trials. In John chapter 10 and verse 27, we have a precious promise from Jesus Verse 27, he says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. You know, no one can snatch you out of the hand of God. No one can snatch you out of his hand. No one can force you uh, uh, away from God. No one's ever going to exert enough pressure on you uh, that somehow God will release you and that he, he, he won't care for you and that he'll fall back on the promises that he's made to you to keep you and to sustain you in this life. You know the only thing that has the power to remove me from the Father's hand? It's me. It's my own sin. In Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, he says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save. His ear is not heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God. And your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. The only thing, the only thing that can come between me and God is my sin. The only thing that can take me away from the promises that he's made to me is my own choice to choose against his way and to walk away from the cleansing that I have in Jesus Christ, to step out of the way of God and into my own way. So this is the only thing because no one else can force you out. No one else can snatch you out, but you can step out. So don't. Choose righteousness every time. He's made a promise to be our constant and faithful companion throughout life. In Matthew 28 and verse 20, he says, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. He says, I'm always there. In Hebrews 13 and verse 5, the Holy Spirit reminds us again of that promise. He says, let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He says, I'm with you, and I'll walk with you, and I'll help you through life. And we have an amazing example of God staying with someone in the book of Job in the Old Testament. And as you go through that book and you see one by one all of his friends and his family leave. His wife even says, curse God and die, Job. He says, I will not. He says, as long as breath is in my nostrils, I will not Put away my integrity. Why? Because God was faithful. And Job said, I will follow his example and I will be faithful to him. And last this morning, God has promised eternal life. God has promised eternal life to you and to me personally. Uh, that you might have confidence, that you might know you have a home in eternal bliss with the Father, with the creator of the universe, with the one who holds everything in his hand. He is looking at you as the object of his love, and he's saying, I have a place for you, a prepared place for a prepared people, as he teaches us in John 14. He says, I'm preparing a place 
for you. Now, you build a life as preparation for this place. If you want to see a peace that passes all understanding, a, a place uh, that, that goes beyond any ability that we have to comprehend, it's heaven. And it's living in the bliss and the, and the presence of God and the peace that surrounds the Holy One. In 1 Timothy 4 and verse 8, he says, bodily exercise, it, it, it profits a little. But then notice what he says, but godliness is profitable for all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. He says godliness. This is what I'm trying to build in you through my promises. As he told us in 2 Peter 1 and verse 4, he says, listen, these promises are there that you might grow into godly people. And that you might follow after him first. And so he says, look, uh, you know, it's, it's great to, uh, to exercise and to keep your body fit and to be well in this life. But it pales in comparison. It's nothing in comparison to the hope that we have in glory with God because of what Jesus has accomplished. In Titus 1 and verse 2, it says, In hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began. If this was the only promise he ever made, it'd be worth all the trials and all the struggles that we face, wouldn't it? If this was the only promise that we had from God, this would make it all worthwhile. This would make this life seem like no problem. If we knew that in the end we had a promise from the Creator that he will deliver us. I want to remind you, though, that these promises are obviously conditional. God doesn't say this blanket statement just to anyone in the world. No, what he says is, I've sent my son because I so loved the world that anyone who believes, when you come to God, you lay down your belief in self. You lay down your, your unfaithful spirit. You lay down your, your ability to do nothing of consequence in eternity. And you surrender it to God Almighty. And you say, Father, I believe in you. Father, I will follow you. Father, I'll put you first. And it's not that somehow you've got to earn his favor. Somehow you've got to earn these promises to be fulfilled. No, you just have to submit to his way of living life. That you might live a life that brings glory to his name. That you might stand on the promises that God has given to us. He says, these exceedingly great and precious promises, so that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature. He says, stop living like the world and start living like Christ. Start living like you know who Jesus is. Start living like you know that you are redeemed from the ways of this world. Start living uh, in a way that brings glory and honor to God because he's made promises to you that no one can take away. If you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, we encourage you. Become a Christian so that these promises will be yours. Without Christ in your life, these promises, they're made to those who are in Christ. And only to those who are in Christ. So come to Christ that you might have these promises in your life also. And if you are a Christian but you haven't lived like you're loved, if you haven't lived like these promises were made to you, if you haven't really stood on the promises and allowed your life to have a confidence, a peace that walks with you and that carries you, that helps you overcome any situation, change. Because you have everything in Jesus Christ. And there is nothing more that you need to gain or that you need to run after in this life other than Jesus Christ and the salvation that's offered in his name. Whatever your need is, won't you come while we stand and we sing this song?